on behalf of the Indian Academy of Sciences, I have great pleasure in welcoming you all to the 28th media meeting of the Academy. the academy uh, for uh, giving me a chance to tell about what we have been doing in NII, National Institute of Immunology, for the last 13 years I have been there. So uh, I'm trying to go a little basic because the students are also here and also it's a diverse audience. So the subcellular organelles we are all familiar with within the eukaryotic cells and, and they, uh, we are listed here some of them but there are many more. Two of the major subcellular organelles which today we will focus on are the nucleus and the mitochondria. And all of us know that, okay, there is only one nucleus, of course, but there are plenty of mitochondria which we are there in per cell of the eukaryotes. So within each my, uh, nucleus, what we have is our DNA, our complement of DNA. And they are not, though in the textbook, it is, written, it is uh, drawn mostly as this, but it is rarely as this. It is always a much more compact version of DNA which is present in each and every of our cells. So that there are different processes by which the compaction takes place. There are different parameters by which it happens. And But the problem is, suppose you have a DNA damage, the proteins and the drugs which will access the DNA damage has to find it within this huge complex DNA present, which is present in each of our cells. So there are different types of DNA damages which happen. And I will come back to this process of compaction and decompaction a little later. There are different processes which are there. Some of them are listed here, but they are not absolute. It's like UV light, all of us know, X-rays and ionizing radiation. There are also replication errors, replication stresses, all of which causes different types of DNA damage. And they are repaired by different types of repair processes. Some of them are, uh, are here also. This is an old uh, one, but there are many new repair processes taking place. These are the classical ones, mismatch repair, homologous recombination, nucleotide excision repair. So there are different proteins. There are process specific proteins which actually do this job of repair. It cannot that any protein cannot do any type of repair. So within this, there is a family of proteins which we are interested in, and I will tell you why we are interested in. This is a family of proteins which is conserved across the, UK, across the entire evolution, as you can see from E. coli to the human. This is called recuhelicase family. Within the human, there are five members, and within these, these three proteins, WRN, BLM, and RECU4, have special significance. What is the special significance? Because mutations in each of them pushes the people who have the mutations, either it is heterozygous or it is homozygous, into a cancer predisposition syndrome. The patients have much more, the, even the heterozygous have much more predisposition towards cancer. Suppose uh, when, when BLM is mutated, it leads to Bloom syndrome, Recule 4, Rothman thompson syndrome, and this one is Oerner syndrome. In our lab, we will work, we work on two different of these. BLM and RECU4. The first part of the talk will be majority on the BLM. In the last part, I will talk a little bit on the RECU4. So this is a Bloom syndrome, a cancer-prone disorder. As I had told it already, there are different types of clinical syndromes as symptoms which are there, which includes diabetes and fertility problems, immune deficiency. What has the come up is a summary of the work which has been done by many labs. Uh, is a genome surveillance work of the BLM it is involved in homologous recombination, bloom functions also in DNA damage sensing and recombination. And when people go to the bloom, uh, hospital even today is the gold standard is here that there is a huge increase in the rate of recombination. So there is a huge increase in the rate of cystochromatid exchanges. So in normal situation, there is only one or two, but here it comes can out to 40 or 50. 
So the remodeling of the chromatin, I started off with that. So does Bloom, one of the questions, one of the earliest questions which we asked at that time was, does Bloom have a, have a way of remodeling the chromatin? What is the Bloom? Bloom is a helicase, it unwinds the DNA. So the question was, is it involved in remodeling of the chromatin in some way? So what we found, and what is the remodeling of the chromatin? This is again the compaction, decompaction story which I told you. So under normal circumstances, there is a group of proteins which keeps the uh, DNA in a very compact form, the deacetylases, the repressor molecules. While when there is a re when there is an opening up of the chromatin, it is the remodelers which allow the remodeling to take place. It is an energy dependent process, so ATP is required, and there are different proteins like the hats, like the activators, which will help the remodelers and help the transcription machinery to come, help the repair proteins to see it. So the question we asked at that time, again rephrasing it, does Bloom help in this process? So one of the things which we saw, as I said, it is an ATP dependent process. You have to you, you have to use energy to open up the chromatin. And what we saw was that using recombinant bloom, using the full length bloom, what we saw that there is an ink, the bloom helps in the st ATP stimulation of a remodeler, which is called RAD54. So that was good, but does it help in the remod, it is the ATPs, so does it help actually in the remodeling process also? So we did a remodeling experiment in which actually there is a complicated assay where you have a restriction site under normally, which is in the closed conformation. So when this remodeling happens, this, con this restriction and sites gets opened up. And what we saw indeed, that it is the bloom, which helps the full length bloom, which helps the process. And not only the full length bloom, it is a very small region of bloom in the end, extreme end terminus, which actually help the process. Subsequently, we have gone ahead to identify 32 amino acid peptide, and I will come right at the end what we are doing with the 32 amino acid peptide. So now that we have found out that bloom actually helps in the process of remodeling, how does bloom recognize the DNA? So how did we, uh, how does this protein go and bind with the regions of the DNA where it is undergoing damage? So before I go into that, let me just brush up the memory about a pathway, which is called ubiquitylation pathway. This is a pathway in which you add, there is a eight amino acid protein, which is called ubiquitin, and it involves the addition of this ubiquitin moieties onto the target protein. It involves a complex three-step mechanism. The last one is the most important celebrated one, the E3 ligases, which allows the adding of the ubiquitin to the substrate. So Bloom, uh, so I will talk about bloom later, but this is the type of ubiquitylations which are there. There are different types of ubiquitylations. This is the ubiquitylation which pushes the cells into a degradation. And this is the type of ubiquitylations which is required for cells to undergo a different type of work which is called signal transduction. And that can be involving different types of cellular processes including the DNA repair. So when we asked, and the question coming back to the, this protein, the BLM, so we asked whether bloom is involved in ubiquitylation. The first question, of course, was whether bloom actually is ubiquitylated by itself. So in, uh, when we put the cells under this type of damage, which is called replication errors, inducing replication errors, hydroxyurea, we saw very, very nice co-localization of bloom with the ubiquitin moieties very nice co-localization of the bloom with the ubiquitin moieties, which increases after the DNA damage. And then, to cut a long, very long story short, what we found out the exact mechanism, how bloom goes to the site of damage, it undergoes ubiquitylation at three specific sites. So one zero, uh, there are three sites in the end terminus, 105, 225, 259, and when you mutate each of these sites, bloom remains in the place where it is supposed to be the housekeeping place, the loft state place, which is the nucleolus, or the PML bodies. These are the off state place. Bloom will remain as a reservoir there, and when there is a, there is a damage, Bloom undergoes ubiquitylation with the help of two E3 ligases. I mentioned about the E3 ligases, which help in the attachment of the ubiquitin moieties, and it goes to the site of damage where from monoubiquitination, multiple ubiquitination comes with the help of another E3 ligase, which is RNF168, and there it brings the, uh, it helps in the process of the DNA repair. So this was the way by which Bloom gets recruited. 
So we saw that Bloom helps in the chromatin remodeling. It helps in the recruitment. It goes to the site of damage. But how does one's Bloom, when it's recruited, affect the DNA repair process, the homologous recombination? So in the same system, we have, we have actually identified the sites, the ubiquitination sites. So we mutated those ubiquitination sites. In the cellular context, we made completely situations where either it is off or on. And when you can see it here in bloom patient cells, there is a high level of recombination. But when, in the, when we put back full length bloom, the recombination level just goes down. But when we put back the three ubiqu ubiquitin moieties, which are mutated, that is bloom cannot go to the site of damage. There is a high level of recombination. So these ubiquitination sites are involved in taking bloom to the site of damage and thereby preventing the, and thereby uh, helping bloom to act as a, uh, repair protein. So is ubiquitination the only way by which bloom can go to the site of damage? No. Actually, and do its work as a recombination part, bloom also has other methods by which it works on the recombination aspect. During the process of recombination, there is a, uh, there is a step which is called the nucleoprotein filament formation, where there is a protein called RAD51, which actually from one sister chromatid will jump into another sister chromatid and thereby help in the process of the repair. So, but everything has to be regulated. You cannot have hyper recombination so that the bloom helps in the process of chopping off RAD51 when the work of the RAD51 gets over. Let me put it, that was in a very layman's language. Let me put it in an experimental scenario. When RAT51 filaments are formed, when bloom we add, actually there is a dissolution of the RAT51 nucleofilament. And this process of bloom dissolution of RAT51 filaments is helped by a, a phosphorylation event at Theonine 99, and we showed it uh, in this work. So now, now that we have learned about how the bloom goes, how does the, some of its function, uh, then we are to, wanted to uh, focus also on another part, which is that how does the turnover of this protein takes place? This is a cell cycle, this is a mammalian cell cycle, and all of us almost know that there are different phases of the cell cycle, the G0, G1, then there is a S phase, then there is a M phase, and this is the M phase where from one cell there is actually a mitosis program where there are multiplication of these cells takes place. So then we wanted to see what happens during the process of uh, bloom turnover. So I don't know whether this, uh, there is a video here, but that's not, not besides the point. So here, there, as, uh, as you can see, this is a mitotic cells. You can see the, um, uh, the typical mitotic cells, and these are the asynchronous uh, cells which are in other phases of the cell cycle. This is about to undergo division, and the amount of bloom was very low. So this was the first hint that the bloom may undergo turnover during the process of mitosis. So indeed, we saw that when, when we pull down the bloom, when we actually purify, immunopurify the bloom and look for the ubiquitination, bloom is undergoing uh, less amount. And this less amount is because bloom is undergoing ubiquitination during the process of mitosis. So to go to the molecular again, again, how did we find out? How did the exact mechanism happen? Again, I'm summarizing the entire mechanism in this work that bloom uh, in, during the process of mitosis undergoes a first phosphorylation at one amino acid, which we say it at 182. It's a key phosphorylation event. This phosphorylation event allows the GSK3 beta mediated phosphorylation at two other amino acids at uh, 171 and cyclin A2 phosphorylation at 175. So this is a sequential phosphorylation which we took to place. And then this sequential phosphorylation, 171 and 175, this is called a phosphodegron. This is a motif which is recognized by an E3 ligase during the M phase, only during the M phase. So this E3 ligase actually now chops a bloom into a major degradation pathway by which bloom undergoes turnover. So this is what the mechanism which we found out that bloom undergoes turnover but only during the mitosis, uh, during the process of mitosis when ABW7 will, uh, will, will recognize bloom. And ABW7 and bloom has other functions which I will come to in a few minutes. So there's a sequential phosphorylation followed by ubiquitylation which is recognized by E3 ligase so that it can go into a degradation program. But what happens if bloom cannot undergo cell cycle dependent turnover? If is too much of a good thing is bad, 
Yes, indeed. Too much of a good thing is bad. So if suppose we made stable lines, we had stable lines where we have actually we have put in the wild type bloom, we have put in the bloom without uh, the threonine one eighty two phosphorylation, the key phosphorylation I told you, and in those cells there is an inherent more and more damage getting uh, accumulated. So you have too much of a tumor suppressor and it actually accumulates more and more damage. It causes more and more break. As you can see it here, the 182 phosphorylation is missing, more and more breaks, more and more quadriradials, and there is a lag in chromosomes also. So what it says, the lack of bloom turnover actually leads to chroma and genome instability. So this explains probably at the later stage, extreme late stages of carcinogenesis, why the level of bloom actually increases. So can bloom carry out its functions apart from acting as a DNA damage sensor, DNA damage repair proteins? Indeed it does. So when we looked at, this is a parallel project which was going on, when we looked at the levels of uh, the other proteins, that other tumor onco oncoproteins, we found that there are three proteins which are classical oncogenes whose levels are abnormally low in presence of bloom. And when we prevent the degradation in the cells with the help of proteosomal inhibitor which prevent the degradation, we saw these levels are coming back, indicating that, that there are functions of bloom in that. So what we found out in that one was that in the using xenograph model, that bloom actually helps in the degradation process of these proteins by helping these proteins like CMIX, like CJUN, to bind better with its E3 ligase, which is FBW7 again, but not in the mitotic phase, in the asynchronous, in the other phases of the cell cycle. And this process of binding helps in the process of degradation. So the last uh, four and a half minutes, I will talk about the mito how does mitochondria contribute to genome stability. This is the second helicase which we are working on, the recuful helicase. This is also autosomal recessive disorder, is also works towards the cancer, it has its peculiar symptoms, and, and these are the uh, uh, proteins, we, and the protein is involved in, we have shown it that it is one of the second in mitochondrial helicase which, is, which, are, which was discovered. So we were the, one of the two labs which almost simultaneously actu actually showed that this protein localizes to the mitochondria, not only to the mitochondria, but to the mitochondrial nucleoids where mitochondrial replication takes place. And also it actually helps to keep, under normal condition to bring a tumor suppressor P53 to the mitochondria and keep it in the off state. It has its own mitochondrial localization signal and then using a variety of assays, we actually showed that this protein helps in the binding of the DNA polymerase or mitochondrial DNA polymerase better to its DNA and helps in the better functioning of this polymerase with the help of polymerization assay or with the exonuclease assay. This is the only polymerase, probably one of the few polymerases which has both the functions combined polymerization and exonuclease. So how does the mitochondrial function continue of, of Requel for contribute to the carcinogenesis? We made defined cell lines where Requel 4, which has a nuclear function also, cannot go to the mitochondria. It remains only in the nucleus and it can remain only, the, it can remain both in the nucleus and mitochondria. So this is the normal, this is the only nucleus. When there is Requel 4 cannot go to the mitochondria, it has a increase, um, it has a decrease in the level of the mitochondrial membrane potential as you can see it here. The Christie of the mitochondria is deformed, the mitochondrial ROS gets increased and this is because of the abnormal levels of the inactive sorts which are getting accumulated there. We went to the molecular level, we found that there is a deficiency of complex 5 formation which leads to the uh, defect in the intracellular ATP formation and there is actually a glycolytic shift from the, elect from the ETC chain, from, th from the ETC, which is the normal way by the ATP is produced into a glycolytic process by which phosphofructokinase is increased and the level of lactate and is also increased. So the absence of a one protein from the, in, from the mitochondria actually causes a shift from the electron transport chain into a glycolytic pathway. And this has a physiological consequence. It helps in the invasion of the cells. It helps in the much more better invasion of these cells when we do the assay in our, with these cell lines which are expressing either the full length Requel 4 or the Requel 4 which cannot go to the mitochondria. 
So this is the uh, summary of whatever I said. There is also the in, in case of Requel 4, there is a decrease in the mitochondrial replication which causes a difference in the mitochondrial structures. Mitochondrial permeability is decreased and at the same time this causes an increase in the aerobic glycolysis, increased invasion capability and there is an increase in the neoplastic transformation which is the first step of the carcinogenesis process. So I will uh, probably, there's one more slide should be, yeah. So I, so this is the uh, slide which, uh, uh, which probably sums it up. So we are interested in the uh, cost talk between the nucleus and the mitochondria. We are trying to understand how the mitochondria actually cross talks with the nucleus. And the whole thing is dependent, uh, is to want to study understanding the mechanism of genome in uh, integrity, which is the shield against the cancer. The basic biological questions we have asked, some of them are here. That understanding DNA metabolism process, the process of homologous recombination. I have told it something, mechanism DNA replication in the mitochondria, dictate the, how the uh, proteins are recruited, mechanisms of the inhibition of the oncogenes, oncoproteins by the tumor suppressors. We have found out certain things and using these, we have actually some of the translation and outputs we have done. I have not talked about it, but we have now found out a microRNA based biomarker signature for colon cancer. Incidentally, colon cancer is one of the major types of cancer which is present in the Bloom syndrome patients. There is a small molecule identified which can revert the resistance to multiple drugs, I am through. And the, and the mitochondrial signature was identified which actually has led to a new patent um, both in EU and India. And the future of course is here trying to understand the biomarkers of multiple cancers, small molecules in clinical trials, trying to get them into the clinical uh, trials here, has to make the genome edited uh, animals we are trying to get into that and reversion of the mitochondrial diseases. So the most important slides are actually here, the, I will not be listed out, here are the past members, here are the present members. I am indebted to my collaborators uh, who over the years have helped me try from my postdoc days and the fundings which have been from all the national, from the national uh, funding agencies in India. So I'd like to thank uh, all of you and take questions. Uh, in general, a lot of anti-cancer drugs work on the principle of enhancing, of altering the mitochondrial membrane potential, enhancing apoptosis and causing cell death. Yeah. yeah? So how do you correlate this with the data that you have? Uh... Yeah, so uh, that is uh, pushing the cells into apoptotic program. So that is a completely different mechanism compared to what we see when this is not only for us, there are many others also where the mitochondrial depolarization amendment potential is not up to the mark, which actually in many cases what happens is the products of the third messengers from the mitochondria gets leached out, goes back to the nucleus and causes a retrograde signaling. That is what is the next phase of work which is going on in the lab, trying to understand the retrograde signaling from the mitochondria into the nucleus because of the leaky mitochondria which will happen because of this. Yeah, I have to apologize to you beforehand. I'm a mathematician, I'm not a biologist. But I heard that the DNA sequence is a very long one. And at each position is the ACGT. When you talk about migration, or, or what do you really mean? You, you have you identified a particular site which, is, uh, which will cause this cancer problem? No. What is, what is, it is an uh, important question actually, the, whether the damages which happen inside the cells do yes. not happen on a specific site right. basis. It can happen anywhere. Uh -huh. So the DNA is compact, as you said, DNA yeah. is very compact. Each cell of the DNA probably has, unless it was compacted, it will never have fitted into the right. brain. So, but it, when the damage happens, you mm. need access to that damage whether it is for the DNA repair proteins or for probably for the drugs also. I see. So what I mean for remodeling is mm. to make the DNA from a compact stage, which is required from one cell to two cell to four cell stages, 
to a transient situation where the DNA has to be opened up, has to be decompacted, has to be remodeled, so that the repair protein, not only the repair protein, even the transcription, the cascade or the crescendo of genes which are getting turned on and turned off yeah. at every stage, they need to be opened up. They need to be taken off uh, at defined time in a defined space. So those are the things which I meant as a remodeling concept. Okay, thanks. Yeah, does, this, please. Uh, does, does this have any connection to epigenetics? Has yeah, yeah, sure. This is, the, this is a completely epigenetic situation. The, uh, there, are, there are different um, uh, marks on the DNA. There are not only DNA, there are different marks on the proteins which, are, which the DNA is putting in together. There are concepts of, of which will be acting as a genetic, as a histone code. There are different tails of these histones which leach out from the, move out of the histone uh, octamer which is there. And this is almost like a symphony that for this type of biological process, this type of changes will be there in the end terminal of H3 or H4, which will cause the compaction or deep compaction to take place. And this histone code, the epigenetics which you are mentioning, is actually one of the major signals by which the chromatin remodelers and the other histone activating proteins or the HDACs are actually recruited to the site of the, of the DNA also.